This is a series where we are talking to leaders in the data value chain who are addressing some of the most complex problems that we are dealing with in the data and analytics space. Now, we all know we live in unprecedented times. The amount of data that we are dealing with is growing every day. Along with that, we have more consumers of data. They are coming to us and asking for, for more use cases to be enabled and deployed. All of this is, is an exciting time for, for this industry, but it also raises a lot of challenges and issues. Some of these issues pertain to things like ensuring we have good performance, we have reliability, data quality, high availability of data and all of that, but nothing beats data security. At the end of the day, none of us, no organization wants to be caught off guard to find out that the data has been compromised. My name is Sanjeev Mohan. I am the host of this series. Today, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome Dr. Adrian Mayers, Chief Information Security Officer at Primera. Welcome, Dr. Mayers. Good morning, Sanjeev, and thanks for having me. Great, let's get started. And uh, would you please do us the honor by introducing your, your company, your department, and, and also talk about how you got into this space? Absolutely. So, um, so I'm Dr. Adrian Mears, and I'm the uh, VP and Chief Information Security Officer at Primera Blue Cross here based in Seattle. So we take care of Washington State and Alaska. We're also part of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. Um, so there's, there's strength in numbers there. So I take care of the, I, I'm in Primera IT, and I take care primarily of the data security, threat intelligence and response, IT risk and resilience, um, and, and, and many other areas, platform security, those kind of things. So holistically, what I look at is making sure that the, the data is secure, the data is being used the right way, and also extending that out to the to the ecosystem, right? We're, and at some point, you know, during this conversation, I'm sure we're going to talk about third and fourth parties. And what does that mean um, when it comes to the the changing landscape, the changing dynamics, as well as the relationship um, being enriched in a different way, just based on the threats that we're dealing with on a daily basis? So your, your question, you know, how did I get into this? I great question. Kind of fell into it. Um, I, I went to school for uh, engineering technology. I was, I was focused on uh, energy management. I was actually going to go into building engineering. That was where, wow. where I was going to, I was going to land, but I, I got kind of bitten by, by digital, you know, programming, understanding how, you know, complex electronic systems work and, and started down that path instead. So, but all the while, there was always this underlying piece about business. Well, how does business work? Um, you, you, you hear a lot about it. I mean, you know, businesses make the world go around. So one of the things that I really wanted to do, and this was actually my time at, at Nokia many years ago, and the bulk of my, my career was spent there, was understanding how does a complex company, global company operating in, in over 130 countries, how does that work? What is the theory behind that? What is the education and the academics to make something like that work while at the same time being able to experience it in real time? What well, was a, a tremendous education, let's just say that. So after, after that, and while I was there, you know, doing a lot of things in the corporate security space, um, information security was a part of it, I started realizing that things are becoming more digitized. Um, we are seeing less and less brick and mortar the modalities of selling, the modalities of, of, of the society is changing, right? Where we're starting to see native digitization happening, you know, generations coming up and only knowing the internet. So there, I, I saw it as an opportunity to kind of shift over. There was still that protect and defend mentality mindset. Always had it since I was a little kid. But the big thing for me was, okay, how do I start to hone my craft a little bit more you know, in, in that space. So Chief Information Security Officer um, seemed like the right path for me to, for me to take. So started doing, um, oh, please. So, uh, no, no, please go ahead. Uh, this, this, this is fascinating because it's security. When I went to engineering school, 
we didn't have like a security discipline to go master in, you know, and now there's like cybersecurity and there's, it's a whole industry by itself. So your story is very inspiring. Thank you. It, 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 it really is. I love the way that, that, you know, education has evolved. I love the way that companies and businesses now value security. Now, let me be clear. There's still a struggle. Um, there's still some, some, some mindsets around, well, security is something that we just have to have. We'll bolt it on at the end. Um, that's changing rapidly because you're seeing that threat landscape evolving so quickly that any company operating is now susceptible and realizes that and is now looking for defenses and, and ways to curtail those, those, those threat vectors and to really stop those threat actors in their tracks so that it doesn't you know, um, dilute the, the efforts of their business and by extension impacting their customers, whether it be products or services, everybody needs to be thinking about security in a fundamental way. Um, please. Yeah, which is interesting because security uh, affects a full stack, the entire stack. So you got security at application level, at uh, data infrastructure, privacy. So when you, how does your day-to-day -day life look? Because, because you, you have to interact with and collaborate with so many people and I'm sure they all have different agendas and priorities and a data scientist wants access to data because they want, they want the agility and their goals are different from yours. Well, you, you, well, it's interesting that you say that. Their goals are different than mine, but they're not, right? The, the key piece to those conversations, and I have many um, meetings all day long, but I enjoy those because it gives me touch points and the ability to look for those common denominators, right? To look for the things that, that we share. Their goals are the same as mine because they're making a significant contribution to the company and by extension are 2.6 million members who are relying on Primera to get it right every day and to protect that information. So when I'm having a conversation with our, our privacy official or, or someone in IT, a software engineer, a platform engineer, networking, whatever it is, legal, HR, um, compliance and ethics, there's always a common thread. What is your mission and how do I augment and enrich your mission? And by extension, how do you help me accomplish mine, which is really protecting and defending the business interests of the company, period. So it, it's, it's really a, what I like to call a patchwork. If you think about a quilt, a quilt is made up of a bunch of different patches. The key thing is to identify the thread that pulls all of those things together. And the thread has to be strong enough to deal and weather with the pushing and pulling of industry. Competitive landscapes are one thing. The threat landscape is something else. The regulatory landscape is yet another dimension that we have to navigate. So under all of that tension, how do we start to galvanize our efforts and come together in a cohesive way to fulfill the overall mission of the company, which is truly making healthcare work better? That is our purpose. That is our mission. That is what we do at this company. And by extension, what the, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association is doing. So I am I am super stoked to hear you bring so much passion and, and energy to this role. Uh, and it's, it's great to see, you know, uh, it's uh, so many times I talk to security people and they tend to be a bit cynical, uh, you know, so uh, I'm sure you, you get to see that uh, probably. So in spite of, of, of this, this wonderful enthusiasm you bring, I'm sure there are challenges that you have to deal with pretty much every day. Uh, would you uh, care to educate us on what are some of the challenges that either you see, and if not in your organization, maybe you hear it from your counterparts and you see a common theme? Well, I, I, think, there's a, there's, I think there's a few things, right? So if I look at it from an industry standpoint, um, healthcare at its core is about helping people. Um, you know, and the healthcare vertical has, has so many facets to it. Um, so working with, with organizations like the, the Healthcare Security Council, mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, Health Sector Security you know, Coordinating Council, uh, HISAC, which is uh, an organization that, that shares intelligence broadly across the health industry. Mm -hmm. When I think about how the industry is under attack from threat actors, 
um, there, there is a clear and present danger that requires um, a collective effort to, to help defend. And what does that mean? Truly, it means it's a whole nation um, requirement. So it's government, it's private industry, associations, everybody has to come together. And then by extension, globally, we're seeing the same things happening you know, in health industries and other countries. So what is the global effort to be able to pull all of these things together? So that's, that's kind of the Uber problem that I see. When mm -hmm. I click it down you know, a, a few notches, I think about what are we seeing at, at ground level, right? What is the ground truth at, at Primera? So on a daily basis, and we, we think about what does digi digitization look like? What is that pace of change? What is, what is fast enough, but what is too fast? What do we move first? You know, what do we change as we start to migrate you know, aggressively to the cloud, moving our workloads there? Um, how do we do that in a way that doesn't break the, the workflows? It doesn't you know, stop us from being able to to enable our business and by extension drive value back to our customers and members. So there's always this teeter tottering. Um, and then all the while it's how are we doing this securely? Every time you move something from one, one location to the next, how are you doing it? Is it susceptible to threat? You know, what are the vulnerabilities that we have to deal with on a daily basis? It's it's no longer just waiting for for, for, you know, for past Tuesdays, you really have to be a lot more active. And yes, it still plays into it, but there's a lot of forward leaning. Um, and I would say vulnerability management actually has to shift left and be a lot more proactive in this idea of ownership and accountability and nurturing of your systems and applications is absolutely critical. So working to find out what's the balance there because the teams specifically in IT aren't just there to, to do vulnerability management. They actually have other things that they need to accomplish. So how do we find that right harmonization and balance where the systems are healthy, they're also innovating at, at, the, at the pace of change and the pace of expectation of the customer and the market. The market expects that we move, we are going to move at a certain pace to make sure that we remain competitive and relevant. So there's, there's always these interesting tensions that pop up. And oh, by the way, as I said before, there's this regulatory aspect to this. So one of the things and one of the, the narratives that I've really been talking about is that regulators and, and, and business truly want the same thing at the end of the day. If you distill it down and you think about compliance in a very different way, you can find some commonalities there. So by extension, how I see it is if you have a healthy security program, for example, the byproduct will be compliance. You will get something out of it. You will get, you know, the, the credit you deserve. But going just for compliance is not going to give you the security program that you need. And, and honestly, that your members and your customers deserve. This is 2021. We have to step it up. We have to do things in a very different way, in an intentional way. It's no longer, well, what's the, what's the least amount that we need to do? No, push farther, push harder. So this this uh, this is a great topic. Uh, I'm just curious. A lot of insurance companies that I talk to are still very heavy users of mainframes. Do you have mainframes? I do. <laughs> we do not. Uh, and <laughs> I, I I laugh only yeah. because it, if you look if you look at a competitive landscape, yeah. You know, what are those things that force change? So there hasn't been, you know, an uprising or demand from customers or members to say, you know, get on to net new technology. Honestly, sometimes, it, you know, and, I, and I, I fully understand if it's not broken, don't fix it. Yeah. However, I would argue that, you know, innovating and, and moving past, you know, some of the, these older technologies and platforms is the right thing to do. There has to be an evolution. Right. You will only get better at what you're doing. The ability to deliver even greater value to your customers and members is absolutely right. critical. So some, some are still hanging on to, you know, to their, to their mainframes and I, and I get it, but you know, the cloud is, uh, it's an interesting place. It's not Narnia. <laughs> so, no, I, I, which is which is exactly where I was heading to. The reason I got distracted by by mainframe, I, I wanted to get it out of the way. 
but you are still, you know, in an environment where uh, you're, I'm sure, hybrid, you've, you've got on-premises, and I wonder if you are multi-cloud, you, you know, if you're trying with different uh, cloud. So, so before you get into that, I would love to get your uh, view on how are you handling this whole modernization of infrastructure going from being 100% on-prem to becoming hybrid and multi-cloud? The key thing is to find good strategic partners, good, you know, cloud mm -hmm. service providers and, nice. and building relationships um, with them deeply to understand what's available in their entire cloud stack and how does that fit in? How do you customize, you know, your efforts to what they, what they can offer and how do you build that out at scale? And then obviously leveraging, you know, all of the benefits of the cloud computing, elasticity, storage, all of those things, the ability mm -hmm to spin up and spin down workloads very, very quickly. But that kind of flexibility is what's needed to be able to keep up with the, the pace of change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having data centers, you know, and yes, we do, you know, right now we do have a, you know, hybrid footprint, but mm -hmm. there are concerted efforts to move to the cloud. That mm -hmm. is where we're going. That is the future. That is what's going to keep us relevant in the space. And there, are, you don't have situations where regulations demand that you still stay on prem, or you you can, as long as you meet their requirements, you can be hundred percent in the cloud. Well, this is like this is exactly it. Um, you know, it was interesting. You know, I, I heard something similar this week that oh, we we can't we can't go uh, mm -hmm. because because of you know protected health information or or other you know other you know intellectual property can't can't live in the cloud there are a number of controls that are available in the cloud to meet those regulatory requirements there's the ability to configure dare mm -hmm. i say in a more just a higher fidelity and really interesting ways to protect uh, data in in cloud environments whether it be azure aws google I, ibm oracle wherever it is there's yeah. enough controls that they offer to be able to hone that now yeah. here's the key piece is you have to take the time to configure these things correctly. You have to take the time to make sure that there is a configuration management aspect to this. There is some oversight. There is the ability to understand what are the behaviors that are happening in your environment and the ability to alert and respond accordingly in real time. Automation as much as possible because things operating in the cloud you know, happen at, at light speed, if you will. So building it as much automation as possible is absolutely key. Yeah, there's always going to be human intervention there, but yeah. So uh, one of the things that I, you know, talking to a number of uh, people in the security space, I see there are two patterns. One are people who either because they're in a rush because of maybe COVID-19 uh, uh, or uh, it's a cultural issue, they are basically doing a lift and shift into the cloud and they're bringing all the tools uh, into the cloud that they're most familiar with. But then there are others who say, well, security in the cloud is very different from on-prem because on-prem we have to worry about, you know, some of the infrastructure level pieces, but in the cloud it's a shared responsibility model, how is Primera and your team handling the cloud migration? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and there there are two levels to that scale, right? You know, lift and shift. One of the things though, is that when you're lifting and shifting, um, you know, if it's a bad workload, if, if it's not a super efficient application, you're just lifting that problem and taking it with you in, into that environment. So, but understanding that everything can't be re-engineered and re-architected, so because right. that takes time. So how do you start to balance it off? And it's somewhere in the middle. There's applications that, that make sense to like, you know, this is quite modern, the way we, we built it out, it makes sense. Yes, we can move it. So literally it is a, a lift and shift. Um, but some, and, and this is where the, the legacy piece comes in, are, are so antiquated that you have to stop and say, we're, we're, we're not going to, we're not just going to lift this up and, and move it into the cloud. It's actually going to cause us more problems. So mm -hmm. why don't we take this as an opportunity to re-architect, to build it out in a more modernized way, um, to leverage modern engineering techniques and practices, and to truly harness everything from a capability perspective out of the cloud, because there's so much there. So it, it really, it, everybody has to be on their own journey. Every company is on their own journey. It's very customized, but you, you have to weigh it out. 
um, and give yourself enough time to be able to say the things that we want to re-architect, we need to have time to be able to do that. So, you know, running headlong in, into the cloud without being thoughtful is going to cause you problems because you know what? There are threat actors wringing their hands, getting ready for you to make a mistake because you're, you're, you're thinking that the key goal or priority or objective is to get, I just got to get into the cloud as quickly as possible. Oh, what happened? Well, there was a misconfiguration. We moved too quickly and hmm. there, there was a, a database or something that was misconfigured. It was, it was internet facing. Um, hmm. And, and now we have a threat actor in our system and all kinds of bells and whistles are going off and, and headlines are coming up in newspapers. So it, it really is about intentionality. Understand what your core business is. What is the objective here? Every time you, you want to think about technology and innovation and, and, and moving at this really swift pace, stop, pause. What are you trying to accomplish in your business? Like I said at Primera, it's about making healthcare work better for our members and customers. So that is the North Star. That is the guiding principle that we think about. If we run too fast, how is that going to degrade the value proposition back to our members and customers? Oh, well, it, it may impact them. Unacceptable. So, so we're not doing that. What's your next option? So it, it, it's, it has to be options over ultimatums. That has to be. This, our, our CIO, Bridget Katare, says this all the time. Options over ultimatums. What are the options? And then let's have a conversation. Let's balance it out. But all the while, everybody nowadays on virtual calls, everybody on that virtual call knows that it, it's got to be about the customer. The customer is at the center of everything. So if we all share that passion and, and that vision and that understanding, we can have meaningful conversations about what makes sense and what comes next. That is very good. I, I see, I'm seeing a common set of themes emerge from everything that you've said. A, be very structured, thoughtful about what you wanna do with customer, the, the end strategy in mind, not, Technology, just like modernizing for the sake of technology, but what, what, how will it benefit the customer? So I see that as one of your key uh, themes. And the second thing that I'm, I'm hearing is that there's a trade-off and you need to find a balance because there are many options of doing things. What is that right trade-off is a journey that every company has to go on individually. It's not, there's no like prescribed way that, Go do this. You're 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 absolutely right. You you keyed in on an interesting piece there about technology. Um, mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I absolutely love technology, but I understand that technology is something that enriches and augments the human experience. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. Primera, we're solving human problems. So yeah. when you put a person and and that human experience at the center of it, and then you wrap technology around it, then you have something. It's not technology for the sake of technology. That's never going to work. But if you understand how you're going to leverage technology to, to make things better for the human being, that's when that's when you know a solution becomes sustainable and embraced and adopted by many because it's really solving a problem in their lives. That is very well said. Yes. Uh, in fact, just yesterday I was talking to a, a database company, and they're like, "We're doing the serverless." And, uh, you know, and I was telling them that from the end user's point of view, they don't care whether it's multi-tenant serverless or whatever it may be. All they care about is, am I spending time on the, the critical business problems and how is my customer experience at the end of the day? How the data shorted could be the least of their concerns. So that, That's exactly right. That is exactly right. If you if you take a a kind of a service management or customer focused mm -hmm. approach to to leveraging technology and understanding how that potentially internal customer or external customer is going to be impacted, it starts to change the the the, the equation very quickly, and you start making different decisions yeah. because you understand that entire value chain and how that's going to impact that end user. Just as you said, they don't care they have a specific problem that they need to solve and you are there to help them solve it. What the choices that you choose behind the scenes, hopefully they're all secure, but the choices that you choose behind the scenes 
um, have to be the, the ones that are going to enrich the experience and make it easier for that end user to solve that problem. That's great. So it, if you were to do things all over again, so, you know, we, we, we've grown organically and we've had to, you know, find shortcuts or workarounds around, you know, existing uh, legacy technologies or, or the human problems that we have to deal with. But if you were to start afresh, what would be your wish list? What, what, what would you do different? Well, that's a great question. What, what would I do different? Yeah. I think one of the things um, that I would do, and not necessarily at, at Primera, but just throughout <laughs> my entire career, is for all the companies that I've been a part of, and I've been you know part of many, is get really clear on what the business is trying to accomplish. What is our core goal here for that business? Because even though it may, it, and it sounds so simplistic, like, oh, of course everybody understands what we're doing here. Do they? Mm -hmm. I, I would say they don't. I would say that if you pulled all, a whole bunch of different departments in a company, they would tell, they would give you different, you know, derivations of, well, it's sort of like this, and this is what we're sort of accomplishing. Get really crystal on what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. What are, what are the what are the goals and objectives that you're you're trying to drive within your company? And everybody needs to be able to correlate their activities to those things. You don't you don't operate within a vacuum. Nature doesn't tolerate a vacuum. So how are you? tethered to what we're trying to accomplish and if you can be very very clear and succinct about that then you have something because as we start to make these choices day to day um everything's not going to roll up the ceo obviously or, or a, a, another executive leader so you have to make sure that everybody within that organization understands you understand where we're trying to go right you understand what our destination is and how we're going to do it it's not just the what it's the how well, mm -hmm. I, I get it. Here, here, let me paraphrase. Yep, you got it. So now that's the default level, right? That's the default state for all of those decisions that have to be made. You can be assured that everybody's on the same sheet of music and we're playing the same song. But it, we, we don't take the time to do that enough because we assume, and we all know where assumptions can get us. We, we assume that everybody gets it. Stop. Make sure that everybody understands and how they're going to contribute to those goals and objectives of that company. So that is fantastic because the top down laying out the, the data culture, focusing on data literacy. So everybody is part of the same uh, mission and they're all forging ahead in this, you know, in a constant way. That is great within an organization. When we started this call, you said we'll talk about third party. Now you have to deal with government and hospitals and all these other organizations. So how do you transcend things where you don't have a control? It, it, it's all predicated on, on trust. Um, mm -hmm. And what do I mean by that? I don't mean blind trust, mm -hmm. I, but I do mean that the relationship between a third party or fourth party with the, with the core entity is predicated on trust. Now, what do we do to make sure that we sure up that trust, that we maintain that trust? We have contracts, we have expectations, we have things that are documented, but we also have ways of working. There's behaviors, there's expectations that have to be laid down and, and they have to be reinforced. So if we're getting on a call and we're talking about something, this is what the expectation is for how people behave on that call. We're not going to go back to the contract every time when we're, when we're, we're doing a teleconference about something. So that trust has to be there from a behavior standpoint and augmented and enriched and, and, and supported by, by documentation and, and contractual obligations. The other piece is a mindset shift. Mm -hmm. When you think about that, that core entity, you have to look at your extended ecosystem somewhat as part of your company. And yes, you don't have control over it, but you have partners. I don't, I don't see vendors. I see strategic partners. Mm -hmm. I see people that are, that are going to contribute to my objectives and my goals of my company, at, which I told you, you know, numerous times is about my customers and my members. So I have to know that you understand what I'm trying to accomplish and you're ready and willing to make those contributions to that by extension. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you will, you will get your, you will get your money, right? You will get whatever it is, whatever compensation that we've agreed upon. But to think that 
you know, your, your ecosystem ends at your four walls is, is, is extremely naive in this day and age. You have to build deep and rich partnerships with your extended ecosystem. Truly, if you're going to survive in, the, in this threat landscape, it's, it's a feeding frenzy out there right now. So setting expectations, setting goals, making sure that those, those contractual obligations are very clear and setting that behavioral expectation is, is absolutely key. And when you, when you bring in a partner, it's very different it, it, as opposed to having a vendor relationship. And you, and you can talk to any, anybody that, that provides services. Yeah, I have customers that treat me like a partner. They, they really respect me. And by extension, I, I respect them. I want to make sure that I'm not the cause of something negative happening to them. It's very different, very different way of thinking. Dr. Mears, for our listeners who are not aware of the, the industry that you are in, uh, talking about the ecosystem, what would be examples of first, second, third, and fourth parties? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So if, if I start from the, from the IT perspective, right, there are things that, you know, um, vendors that we work with that have SaaS offerings, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of core Uber, you know, SaaS offerings that we're not going to build in-house. Even though we have the ability to do it, it doesn't make sense to use our internal like resources. Electronic health records, EHRs. That, that, that's exactly it. So as, as Primera right now is looking, you know, very, very you know, succinctly and focused on vertical integration, there are, there are different parties and, and, and strategic partners that we have. So we would have, for example, you know, a core relationship with a, um, a security vendor, specifically in my space, you know, security operation, um, you know, to enrich and augment what I'm doing with, with the security operations center. So, and then they have relationships with other vendors that feed into what they deliver to us. So from a service standpoint, and let, let's take threat intelligence, for example, I may have a vendor that's given me threat intelligence that has other vendors that are feeding other threat intelligence into them. It's then customized and, and, and brought to me for what I need, but there are other parties down the stream that are feeding into that. Now, the, the thing that becomes interesting is, you know, who has connectivity and who, who doesn't, who needs connectivity to your network and who doesn't, you know, whether it be through API or whatever, that's where you have to start making some choices. So understanding, you know, what it takes to, to run your business and map it out um, is, is an interesting exercise. I hope that ca- kind of helps. There, there are so many that are kind of third and fourth parties, almost, almost too, too many to, to name. In, in your day-to-day uh, operations, uh, how many data producers and how many data consumers are we talking about? <laughs> Just trying to get an idea as to how big is this ecosystem? How, how, how big is the bread box? Um, <laughs> it, well, it, it's interesting. So you start thinking about, you know, I'll take, you know, one, one of our bigger numbers, right? So 2.6 million members, Alaska and, and Washington with the ability to connect to their, you know, protected health information, their claims information, um, you know, their, their health records, what have you, you know, through some, some of our connectivity. So then you start thinking about, okay, now that I have, you know, about 3,000 employees that are also, you know, kind of using data in, in different ways. Then I have, see, upwards of, you know, maybe a couple thousand vendors that, you know, may or may not use, use data or have connectivity or deliver a service or, or what have you, you know, in our extended ecosystem. Then we are focused on, on vertical integration. So we, we, we are standing up clinics. So mm-hmm. then there's, there's the clinics that we're, we're opening up. And then there's some, some more data and connectivity there. So when you start layering this, it, it becomes tremendously huge. But the, the key thing is that you have to define, you know, your core things. How are we securing APIs? How, how is data classified? Where is data stored? How is data used? How are we using role-based access control and identity access management, um, moving into a zero trust posture to make sure that every transaction and session is interrogated on a continuous basis? There is no assumption that, you know, because you have a username and password, and you've done multi-factor that now you, you, ha- you can go anywhere and do anything. No, that, that can't happen. 
So the ability to do all of these things and define them early allows you to scale almost endlessly. If you look at you know large global companies, this is what they're doing. They've taken the time to define their core and then they can start to scale at a, at a tremendous rate. So you build a foundation and if that foundation is strong and secure, then you can say, now we're gonna go into the clinics business, no problem. We have the API security standards defined. We have the tools, technologies. So, so now we can ensure that the communication is secure. Now that's tomorrow, exactly it. I see. That is, that's a very uh, smart way to do it, which takes us to the next question, which is what advice would you give to people who, who want to get into this space? So the, the advice I would give is that there, there is so much interesting things going on. There are literally new jobs that never existed, you know, 10 years ago that exist today. There, you have to be hungry and you have to stay curious. When you get into this space, you really have to take on the persona of a lifelong learner. Um, and, and that's not a bad thing because if you're curious, you're gonna have questions like I do uh, and you're gonna want answers and you're gonna wanna keep on pushing to figure out, well, why is that? Oh, why are we doing it that way? What is this new technology? How is this new technology used by, by, you know, by, by industry or company? And by extension, how is it used by bad, the bad guys, by threat actors? Um, because we, we see a lot of that. Ransomware is a, a perfect example, right? Where you know, encryption you know, was created to protect and now it's, it's been weaponized and it's used against us. Not great. But it, it really is about staying curious and then getting educated, finding programs in universities, colleges, wherever. Get the education, join associations, like-minded people that are also curious. Learn from, from, from them. Go beyond mentorship and look for sponsorship. Look for, look for people that are willing to help you get to the next level, to point you in the right direction. The only way we're, and, and honestly, it comes down to, you know, it takes a village. The only way that we're all, all going to get better is if we all work with each other. Some are farther down the path than others. Reach back, help somebody else up. That, that you have to pay it forward. It, it's, it's just a fundamental way that I think we all need to be thinking about this. But at the core, be curious, stay curious. Very nice, I, I love it. Uh, any, are there any books that you would recommend or any podcast or, or any resource that you regularly go to or any organization uh, uh, people should join? Oh, there, there are so many. Um, so, there, you know, one, one book comes to mind and it's, it's called The, the Fifth Domain hmm. um, that, that I, I definitely think, you know, people should read because it, it lays down the, the true essence of cyberspace today and hmm. how cyberspace, you know, has great things, but it also has significant challenges and threats and risks. Hmm. Um, a, a podcast, and I, I you know, I'm an, I'm an, guy that let loves you know intelligence right so understanding how the intelligence community operates and, mm. and 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 what have you so there's a podcast that i listen to called intelligence matters with mm. uh, with michael morell um produced by cbs and you can you can find it on you know on all of the all of the platforms i listen to it on spotify but there there are interesting things i push myself to make sure that i understand what's happening from a geopolitical standpoint because cyberspace is now a realm that is leveraged by nation states and non-nation state actors that you, you have to understand, you cannot keep yourself in your, you know, in your shoebox and not understand what's happening from a foreign policy, you know, uh, geopolitics, uh, what's happening from a national perspective, all of these things play into the equation. So, and you see the ripple effects of these things, understand what legislation is happening. How are we partnering strategically with, with our allies who are, um, you know, who are our adversaries? How are we, how are we competing for, for resources or technology or what have you? All of these things play into this. My, my dissertation uh, specifically was around you know, economic cyber espionage hmm. and the impacts to national security and national competitiveness in the US. And through that research, it was very enlightening um, about how how, how much espionage and, and how cyber is being leveraged to be able to, 
to remove intellectual property from from entities you know throughout the US. Um, so it, it like I said, it really is about remaining curious and and put your hand on anything that you can read. There's yeah. tons of great books that are coming out there all the time. So wow, Th this has been fantastic. We can go on forever just speaking <laughs> into your mind and learning from all of your experiences. But before we end the show, I'm going to throw a curveball and then we'll end the show. And the curveball is, Dr. Mayers, tell us something about yourself that the world doesn't know. Something different from technology. Well, it, well it's, it, it, there's a little bit of technology uh, okay. no worries. In, in, in it. But um, one of the things that, yeah, I think the world doesn't know, I'm, I'm a, a big cinephile. I love film. I love movies. I, I love the storytelling. Um, and how that's done, you know, on the big screen. But it's not just the visuals and the, and you know, and that cinematography. It's the way the actors and the, the scripts and the directors choreograph that entire performance and then package it into something that can be consumed in two, three hours, and allows you to to venture into that world and 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 really live that story in a vivid way. Um, it's it's just something that I've always I've always enjoyed. My first movie was Star Wars, and 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 I was done. Sci-fi. I, I became a huge sci-fi fan, and and just loved you know all types of films from from then. Um, my my big sister took me to the uh, to the to the movies, and I was just like, wow, this is great. Uh, and then I saw Jaws, and that and then that, there was a little bit of a pause after that because that scared the heck out of me. But uh, but but films, yeah, I I love I love and respect um, the way films are are created and and presented. And I think there's there's so many more stories to be to be told. And as the technology evolves, they become even more visceral and rich. So, so we look forward to a Hollywood blockbuster written and script by Dr. Adrian Mayers. Outstanding. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. I love it. Great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been such a pleasure and looking forward to having you back sometime in the future. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me. Have a great, great. day. Thank you.